Hello, it's Dr. Omende. So um, this is just to conclude on basic um, intro. So we had left at basic reflex pathway. So we said we have four components. We have a receptor cell. What does this do? It is able to transduce the stimulus. So if it's pain or temperature, that's a stimulus. So it will transduce it into a nerve impulse. A component, we have neurons. So these neurons will conduct from the receptor to the integratory site to effector organs. Then we have the integratory site, which is either the brainstem or the spinal cord, and effector organs, which could be muscle, be a free nerve ending that senses temperature, and then that's your um, afferent neuron that carries that information to the CNS. It could be the spinal cord or brain, and then the effector, um, the efferent neuron, which carries information to either mind, which are the effector organs. So those are that our reflex pathway occurs. So for example, to touch a pan or a pot of hot soup. So it will burn you. What happens? You'll feel the heat and after you could quickly that information, your muscles of the hand to contract and you flex away from the hot pan of food. So those are of a reflex pathway. So again, you can see from the receptors on the skin, like pain receptor, then afferent neuron carries information to the spinal cord. Okay, then an efferent neuron carries information to either a um, muscle or a gland, which are the effector organs. So then we have um, receptors and sensory pathways in uh, neuroanatomy that you need to uh, be very conversant with. So a sensory stimulus usually can evoke a reflex response, which we have seen, and uh, this can be transmitted to the cerebral cortex in a system that comprises three neurons. So we have three neurons. We have a primary order, uh, second order neuron, and a third order neuron. So the primary neuron or first order neuron, what does it do? It's usually either a receptor itself or it synapses with the receptor. And then it may end in the spinal cord or the brainstem. So that's the primary neuron. It may be the receptor or it carries information from the receptor to the spinal cord or brainstem. Then we have second order neuron. Now from the spinal cord and brainstem, it carries information now to thalamus. Then third order neuron from the thalamus to the cerebral cortex. So first order neuron from receptor, okay, to brainstem or spinal cord. Second order neuron from spinal cord or brainstem to thalamus. Third order neuron from the thalamus to the cerebral cortex. Then, so that's basically the sensory pathway. What about the motor pathway? Now, we have two different types of motor. We have somatic from skeletal muscle and visceral from cardiac smooth and uh, glands. So th that's autonomic motor system. So the somatic motor system has two main components. You have two neurons, a lower motor neuron and upper motor neuron. Okay. Now, lower motor neuron is the one that innervates the muscle. It has direct contact with the muscle. So all spinal and motor cranial nerves are lower motor neurons. All spinal and cranial nerves that are motor, have motor components, they are lower motor neurons. Then we have upper motor neurons. Upper motor neurons do not have direct contact with muscles. So why are they called upper motor neurons? They control the lower motor neurons. Okay? They influence the activity of lower motor neurons. So they do not directly contact the muscle. So they just carry information from the cerebral cortex to the spinal cord, then that way they are able to control the lower motor neurons. So they do not contact the muscles. So the axons that form this upper motor system usually occupy specific places in the nervous system and they share an origin and destination. So a collection of myelinated will form tracts and tracts are named from origin to destination corticospinal from cerebral cortex to the spinal cord vestibulospinal from vestibular nuclei to the spinal cord olivospinal from olivary nuclei to the spinal cord reticulospinal from reticular formation to the spinal cord so tracts are a collection of myelinated axons okay and they're named from origin to destination so basically, these are the pathways that you shall learn, okay, in the video that discusses the pathways. So your upper motor neuron is from cerebral cortex to spinal cord. Lower motor neuron is from spinal cord to your effector organ. And then the sense, those, that's motor. And then the sensory pathway, we said, you have from your receptor to the spinal cord, first order neuron. Spinal cord to your thalamus, second order neuron. And then from thalamus to cortex, that's your third order neuron. Lower motor neurons 
um, you can have lesions. These are the ones that, uh, lower motor neurons are the ones that contact the muscles. So lesions of lower motor neuron occur where there's destruction or atrophy of these neurons at the level of the ventral horns of the uh, um, spinal cord. So three, what are the three features of lower motor neuron lesions? There's flaccid paralysis of the muscles. They become very flaccid, okay? And then there's diminished tendon reflexes. So tendon reflexes will reduce or they can even be absent. And then there is atzos. Remember, muscles feed from blood vessels and also feed from the nerves that innervate them. And these are lower motor neurons that directly contact the muscle. So if there is lower motor neuron lesion, you get atrophy of the muscles, tendon reflexes will be absent or reduced, and the muscles will now get uh, flaccid paralysis. In upper motor neuron lesion, on the other hand, there is the paralysis is... Um, it varies okay and usually it's um <laughs> neuron lesions are characterized by the usually spastic paralysis so the limb feels it though the muscles are paralyzed babinski sign now when you stroke the lower the plantar aspect of the foot ideally it's expected that the toes will flex Especially in newborns when you stroke the lower the sole of the foot the plantar aspect the great toe will turn upwards it will not flex and that's normal for a newborn but when you find toe in an adult you say the babinski sign is positive and as injured normally in an adult when you stroke the of the foot there should be full the toes but when there's upturning of the great toe you say positive Babinski sign called upper motor neuron lesion. These are the neurons that do not contact the muscle. Okay? Reflexes will be very exaggerated. And then remember, there's no muscle atrophy because this do not contact the, the muscle. So even if there's upper motor neuron lesion, atrophy, okay? atrophy is sort of shrinkage due to um, disuse or rather due to lack of the neurotrophic factors. And that mainly occurs in lower motor neuron because the nerves contact the muscle. So then um, we go to support and protection of the central nervous system. So the brain is protected by skull, meninges, and CSF, while the spinal cord is protected by the vertebral column, meninges, and cerebrospinal fluid. The meninges have three layers. We have dura mater, that is the outermost, which is very tough, arachnoid mater, which is the intermediate layer, it forms like a spider web. And then the pyre matter, which is the innermost part of the meninges, it's usually intimate um, with the central nervous system and is almost indesirable. So the arachnoid and pyre together form the lepto meninges. Now we have three meningeal spaces. The epidural space, that is outside dura mater. Subdural space is below dura mater, sub below dura, so it's between dura and arachnoid, while subarachnoid is below arachnoid matter, so it's between arachnoid and pyre matter. Subarachnoid space contains blood vessels and cerebrospinal fluid. So this is what we are referring to. So this is your skin, your scalp, your periosteum around the bone, okay? The skull bone, remember it's, it's form of three layer, an outer table, diplo, and an inner table. Then this is the um, endosteum, uh, endosteal layer of the dura mater. Dura mater has two layers, an inner meningeal and an outer endosteal layer. Then you could get to the arachnoid mater. So anything above the dura is epidural, then dura space, outer endosteal, inner meningeal, then subdural space, arachnoid, subarachnoid, before you get to pyre. We said in subarachnoid you have the blood vessels, okay? CSF is a clear fluid usually derived from blood and it's formed by coral plexus of uh, brain cavities which you call the ventricles. So it usually circulates through the ventricles then into the central canal of the spinal cord into the subarachnoid space. Eventually it will be reabsorbed into the dural vena sinuses at the level of superior um, sagittal sinus. Remember it mainly provides cushion effects of the central nervous system. 
So you need to understand neuroanatomy because there are neurological disorders that are common in all over the world. And we have uh, conditions such as cerebrovascular accidents, that's like stroke. Of course, trauma like accidents, infections such as meningitis and encephalitis, then degenerative conditions such as Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's, all these affect the nervous system. And you need to understand neuroanatomy before you can understand how these conditions um, come about. So some of them may be uh, caused by, they may be uh, causes of preventable deaths. Thank you.